Good evening, friends, and welcome to Sleepy Time Tales, a podcast intended to help you sleep. Do you find your mind plagued with the stresses of modern life, especially when you are laying yourself down for a restful night? Does your mind spin and churn? Follow my voice down the path towards a restful night. Listen to me tell a story that will keep your mind from wandering to your daytime problems, the ones that you can't solve right now, and will be easier to solve with a solid night's rest. Listen to my voice and allow yourself to drift, following the twists and turns, but slowly letting go and drifting away into the deep night, the restful sleep. Allow yourself to develop a mindset of focused relaxation rather than the spinning confusion many of us insomniacs face at night. Before we go any further together, I need to take care of some business. It is the sort of thing that usually happens towards the end of most podcasts, but since I'm hoping you're asleep by the time we get that far, I need to mention this stuff now. Firstly, you can find the podcasts, all of the episodes, as well as some blog posts and musings on the website sleepytimetales.net. Comments, questions, suggestions can all be emailed to contact at sleepytimetales.net. You can also find links to all the relevant social media on the website, but you can find the show on Twitter at Sleepy Time Tales and on Facebook on facebook.com slash Sleepy Time Tales podcast. We I also have a channel on YouTube where I'll be putting simple, simple visualizer enhanced versions of the episodes up for your enjoyment. Search for Sleepy Time Tales podcast or follow the link in the show notes. Also in the show notes and on the website is a link to the podcast newsletter where you can sign up or you can also sign up on the website. I will send a weekly update with the latest episodes, blog posts and maybe relevant specials or links to any resources or stores that sell sleep aids if I find anything that I think is worthwhile sharing. Now, if you're enjoying the show and or finding it useful, if it's helping you a couple of nights a week or if you leave it running in the background so my droning voice can sing you to sleep, I would appreciate a bit of support if you can. I was going to hold off a few months on starting a Patreon because I wanted to have a body of work to justify it first, but they recently announced some changes that will make it more expensive and less useful for new creators starting campaigns after May 2019, so I figured I'd just hold my nose and jump in and get started. So the show is free. What reason could you have to pay me for it? Well, there are a couple of reasons. Firstly, maybe you'd just like to. It's a service I provide, mainly to help people out, and if you think that it's something you'd like to support, that may be reason enough. But if you need a more solid reason and you'd like a bit of a sweetener, I do have some reward levels available. There's just two at the moment. I'm keeping things simple at first. So if you can afford a dollar a month, I will genuinely appreciate that. I live in a country where a dollar is actually a usable amount of money. So if you want to back me at a dollar a month, I will, with your permission, list your name on a thank you page on the Sleepy Time Tales website, sleepytimetales.net. Now, while a single dollar single dollar is genuinely a usable amount of money to me, if you add four more to that to make five, we have a very useful amount of money. To thank you for reaching that deeply, I will provide you with an RSS feed of episodes that don't have this section in it where I'm rattling a can asking for money. Also, while I don't have currently have any advertising, that may change in the future, and the five dollar patrons will receive ad free episodes in their custom feed. You can find the Patreon on patreon.com slash sleepytimetales. If a monthly commitment seems a bit much for you, I also do have a tip jar up on the website where you can throw a bit of spare change my way whenever you're so inclined. And again, I'll repeat myself, literally a single dollar is useful. If that's what you can afford and you feel it isn't going to help, please be reassured, it will. Another way you can help without costing yourself anything extra is checking out the affiliate links that I have on many episodes and up on the website. I link to items that are related to the theme of an episode in the shop uh, in the show descriptions, and the website has links to sleep aid products, appliances, and even some very nice looking beds. So take a look if you're on the market. Also, if you're so inclined, please rate and review the podcast on whatever your podcast delivery service of choice is. 
The show can be found on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, SoundCloud. But of course you know that because you found it already. A five-star review will get the show in front of more people. The more people who find it, the more people have a chance of helping find a good night's sleep. If you provide any interesting or funny reviews, I will read them out at the end of an episode as well. So if this show helps you find a good night's sleep, it may help some others. So other than reviews, also please share this show on your social media. It may even help others if it doesn't help you. Everyone who suffers sleepless nights is usually open to options that may work for them, even if it doesn't necessarily work for others. The music in this episode and all episodes thus far is Un Désert by Kumiku. Their music is available on the Free Music Archive. I've also linked their website and their Patreon in the show notes, as they have some very cool stuff released under various names that I recommend checking out. Okay, so on to the prologue. Thank you for sticking around this far. It honestly wouldn't surprise me if some people were asleep already. So what exactly is Sleepy Time Tales, and what is a Sleep Aid Podcast? To answer your question, let me start with a common problem. Do you find yourself lying awake at night, mind spinning and emotions in turmoil with the anxieties of 21st century life? Do you wake up in the middle of the night and find yourself not quite able to doze back off at 3am? I'm here to help. My name is Dave and I'm your narrator, here to talk you into a restful night. I'm someone who has struggled to sleep ever since I was a baby. My parents had sleepless nights with me for many years, and even once I got old enough not to bother them, I struggled to sleep a lot. I discovered far too late in life that droning male voices have a tendency to put me into a deep sleep. I learned this when I was listening to various podcasts at bedtime, or sometimes even during the day when I was at home because I was doing shift work. Eventually I found out that sleep podcasts are a thing. There are quite a lot that read old stories out, even some for adults as well as many for children. I tried one out that was quite special though. It was specially designed for the purpose of distracting the restless mind. It's a show that's been around for a while called Sleep With Me. It worked very well for me, but when I recommended it to others, not everybody liked the narrator's voice. There wasn't anything else quite like it that I could find, so I wondered if I could make an alternative with my droning voice, and here it is. This prologue will go on for a few minutes as I explain the idea behind the podcast and why I think that listening to me will help you. Then after the intro, the story will begin. Before the story starts, maybe try to wind down and grab a glass of water, turn out the lights, and prepare yourself for the experience of sleeping as we prepare to go on a journey together. A journey to a restful night's sleep. Or maybe it's not a journey. Maybe that's not the right metaphor. Maybe we're building a space for you, a sort of mental nest to settle into. The idea is that you listen to me closely as I tell you tonight's story. That you listen and stop the spinning mind that prevents you, like me, from having a restful night's sleep. Don't listen to me too closely though, unless you find me that fascinating, but I'm going to try to prevent that from happening. The story I will tell is going to be a mix of confusing, boring, and maybe a bit pointless and hopefully it creates a state of mind of peaceful resignation. An acceptance of the state of mind, a lack of resistance to the arms of sleep as they reach out to you. It's important though not to force it. Allow the process to happen naturally. Just keep a light mental grip on the thread of my voice and allow the natural need to sleep to slowly wind you down. Listen to the sound of my voice as I tell you a tale. Pretty much every episode at the moment is me trying something new, and tonight is no exception. As I've explained before, so please forgive me if you've been following along and I'm repeating myself, fully written stories as I started out with are very time consuming, and I think it's important that I get content out quite fast, so that I can give you, the listener, the sleepless person, as much as possible to listen to, so I can drone in your ears as much as possible. So tonight I'm trying something new again. I'm going to do an episode recap of the first episode of Twin Peaks. I was quite young and in boarding school when the show originally aired, and I've always wanted to watch it. I've had a go at the pilot of a few times, but I've never been able to quite stick with it. So now I have a reason. I need to watch it and share the experience with you, my dear listener, my dear friend, to try to help you to get a good night's sleep. 
The pilot is a double episode, it's normally feature length, so I've broken it up into two podcast episodes which I will release a week apart. Obviously there will be spoilers for a nearly 30 year old episode of TV, and while the show leans towards some nasty stuff, I'm going to avoid the less pleasant aspects, because I want you to have a good good dream. I want you to have good dreams, not nightmares. I'm hoping that you're asleep before I get to the end of the episode, but don't feel pressurized. It may not work on the first night. Maybe it will take a few nights for you to get used to listening to my voice. Maybe my accent is strange to you. Maybe one episode just isn't long enough. It's very important though that you try to relax. If you're new to the show and prone to late nights staring at the ceiling, it may take a while, even a few days for this to work for you. I'm going to assume here that this podcast goes undiscovered for an extended period. The chances of a bunch of people discovering this in the first few days, weeks, or even months seems pretty slim. If you've discovered this, I probably have a bit of an archive for you to listen to. New episodes will be released every Sunday to give you something fresh to help you rest in a new week. Also, in my first few weeks and months, I'm going to try to release a few extra episodes to help build up an archive to give you, the listener, a night's worth of stories to leave running in the background. So keep an eye out once you've subscribed to see what new stuff I release. So queue up a few episodes or just run through the backlog. What I do with a sleep podcast is I just let it stream all night. I lie down in the dark with my earbuds in and I let it run. Sometimes when I wake up at 3am the stream is still running and I let the voices waft me back to sleep. Sometimes it may be disconnected and so I need to start again. Sometimes I wake up 30 minutes before my alarm goes. Usually I carry on listening and it knocks me right back out. Let me tell you now, that 30 minutes is sometimes the most restful part of my night. There's something about allowing yourself to relax completely right before the alarm that just satisfies on a very deep level. So you have the basic idea. You relax and lie in the dark. While you do that, I tell you a tale. Some nights it might be a story I make up. It might be like tonight where I tell you about a TV show I find interesting. I may find some weird news stories and waffle on for a while about how they make me feel or use those as an improv prompt. As I've said, I'm definitely in an experimental phase at the moment. I'm starting to get an idea of the structure I want to work towards. And if you, the listener, find some types of things work better than others, feel free to let me know through either my social media or the email I provided earlier. So lie there in the dark. Let my voice wash over you. Listen to things you find interesting, but try not to listen too closely. Stay engaged with the sound of my voice and the tale that I spin, but let yourself relax into my droning, sometimes croaky voice. I'll try my hardest not to be too interesting, which a lot of the people I know will tell you shouldn't be too hard. I do have the habit sometimes of going on and on about things I find interesting, but nobody else does. But I'm doing this for your own good, dear listener. My nighttime friend who's elected to lie in the dark, listening to my voice. Thinking about it, that does seem a bit strange, doesn't it? Inviting me, a stranger from somewhere in the world, probably far away, to speak to you in your sleep to speak you to sleep, but you'll always be safe with me. I'm here to help you relax, to improve your life in a small way. Or maybe not so small. People don't sleep very well these days and it makes their lives harder. So I'm here to do my small part to help you in a big way, to help you face tomorrow and the day after, well rested and better able to cope and process. I'm going to tell mostly feel good stories maybe a few mysteries. I mean, tonight is Twin Peaks, but I'll focus on the weird, confusing stuff rather than the sad and depressing stuff. I'm also not going to focus on any of the bad parts of modern life that keep us awake. I will only share stories that relax or make your life better, even if only in small ways. I believe very strongly in the benefits of kindness. I want to be kind to you. I want to share kindness with you. I want you to be kind to yourself. Don't beat yourself up or rebuke yourself over not sleeping. Don't get tense if you just can't get yourself over the edge of sleep, even with me here in your ears trying to help. Forgive yourself, and if I don't seem to be helping, I ask that you forgive me. 
holding it against me or yourself won't help you. Frustration is one of the greatest enemies of a good night's sleep. Frustration is just not being just not being able to get below the edge, to not be able to pull the warm blanket of a restful night over your head. So take a breath, forgive the fact you can't sleep and let my voice wash over you and under you. Take another breath, imagine the warm darkness rising up inviting you to sleep into a better life starting tomorrow. And if you can't let go, forgive yourself and try again tomorrow. If you've had a life of insomnia, sleep is something like an enemy, but it is not your enemy. It's a natural process that we have been pulled away from by stress and life and supposed progress that shines bright lights in our eyes at all hours. I'm here to work with you, to create a safe space, a cocoon in which you can curl up and allow nature to take its course. So if you're still with me, thank you for staying. If you're already asleep, we'll chat again soon. And of course you aren't hearing me except maybe in a dream. So let your dreams be about the story that I'm about to tell you now. Twin Peaks Episode 1 Pilot When Twin Peaks initially aired, I was quite young and I was, I think I was in boarding school at the time, so I never really had an opportunity to watch it much. My parents watched it a bit initially, but it got a little bit strange for them, so they stopped it, stopped eventually. It always seemed very much my kind of thing, the little bit that I knew about it, it being a crime show with a reputation for being very deeply odd and strange, and I was always quite an odd and strange person, yet over the years I've tried to watch it several times and I've stalled out in the pilot. So I figured it was time for me to make a serious stab at it, or a serious go at it. I don't want to sound too violent while you're trying to sleep, despite the fact that this is a TV series about a murder. So now's the time for me to make a serious try to see if I can get through it and share my impressions as someone who is in a culture where Twin Peaks is highly regarded, but I don't actually know all that much about it. And so we begin. The song that starts out is Falling by Judy Cruz. It's quite well known in its day. A very relaxing, minor key little ditty that you know, it's got a lot of charm, it's pretty dated, but it's still quite an interesting piece of music. Um, the intro has the credits, and it is showing, looks like a sawmill blades being sharpened, which looks a little bit ominous, but this seems like a town with uh, economy that's going on nicely. We have uh, nice views of nature, so you know, I've got a good feeling about the show. I'm sure it's going to be very calm and relaxing. Of course, we know that that's not true. But I can imagine being someone watching, sitting down to watch this for the first time, not knowing what to expect, uh, thinking, expecting something maybe like Knots Landing or Dynasty and getting cross-dressing FBI agents and other weird stuff, some of which I've heard of, some of which I haven't. I've actually managed to stay surprisingly unspoiled over the 20 plus years, or geez, I don't even know, maybe even 30 years since it came out. Anyway, Julie Cruz's Falling plays, we have nice nature scenes, the sawmill, and then we go into our show. We have a man who's going fishing early in the morning, it's still a little bit overcast, looks really early, I don't know. The area near Canada, it probably, if it's summer, it probably gets light very late. It's very far north. So we have a older gentleman who's going fishing. He, as he leaves, he waves and gestures to an, an older lady who, maybe it's his wife, I'm not sure, but she doesn't seem very interested in him. He goes out. It's like gorgeous, gorgeous nature out there trees and forests and, and lake with a rocky shoreline. 
There is also another lady that we've seen a couple of shots of, an Asian woman. I don't know who she is. She seems rather mysterious. Let's see if, how this goes. The man goes out, leans on the <coughs> leans on the wall at the, at the side of the lake, and notices a large plastic object. Looks like a bag wrapped around something. Now, if I didn't know what was going on, I would already consider this pretty ominous. This looks like the sort of bag that's uh, large enough to hold a person. As, as it happens, as he spots it, there's the sound of a bell. I know you get buoys sometimes have bells on them, so I think it's that, but it's a rather alarming sound. Gives you a hint that maybe things aren't as idyllic as they initially seem. So, he goes down to investigate the plastic. Is there a person wrapped in there, as it seems? Yes, there is. We see the shape of a body and long hair, so it is probably a woman. The man then phones someone we can find out is called Lucy. We find out the man, his name is Pete Martell. Lucy, uh, she works as a receptionist at the police station. She gives a very detailed account to the local sheriff to where she's transferring the phone explains exactly which table and which phone seems like an unnecessary detail because i mean usually when you transfer calls that phone starts ringing but uh, maybe she just has learned the hard way that she needs to be very specific with these uh, country bumpkin cops i don't know but i'm just speculating she transfers the call the sheriff, a man in his look seems to be mid-thirties, goes and picks up the phone. And the man we know to be now to be called Pete, the fisherman, tells the sheriff she's dead. The sheriff listens for a while. We don't hear much else from Pete. And the sheriff tells Lucy to call the deputies and the doctor and don't tell anybody what's going on. This seems like a strange thing to tell a police receptionist. Maybe our Lucy is a gossip. And we'll find, I'm sure we'll find out as the season goes on. We then cut to the shoreline. The well-dressed doctor and the sheriff are looking at the, at the plastic-wrapped body, while a deputy with long hair is taking photos and starts crying. I don't know this deputy at all yet, but I've got a feeling he's not very well cut out for this job. I get a sense that he always cries. Well, I mean... The sheriff says that this always happens. So, long-haired, long-haired, sensitive deputy seems to be like the kind of person who cries on crime scenes. Photos are taken. The deputy with the camera wanders off, and the doctor and the sheriff roll the body over because it was lying face down. They uncover the face of the body, and the doctor says, "It's Laura Palmer." Now, the one thing we always did know about. The one thing we always did know about um, uh, Twin Peaks is that it was about the murder of a young girl called Laura Palmer. So that's not exactly a spoiler. And it's also like the third minute of the show. The camera cuts to a woman who seems to be making breakfast. She's got a very large perm and she's calling Laura for breakfast. At a guess, I'd say she's probably the mother and she doesn't know yet that her daughter has been found. Um, on the side of the, on the lake shore, no longer able to eat breakfast. She keeps calling Laura, getting more and more irate. Starting to get the sense that maybe Laura wasn't always a good girl because the mother gives the energy that she, there's a sense that, um, this sort of thing has happened before and she's gotten an getting quite annoyed rather than concerned. She searches the entire house and doesn't find Laura anywhere. She phones the parents of someone called Bobby, who at this point I'm assuming is the boyfriend. The Bobby's dad seems military. He's in a black dress uniform with a lot of those stripes that I think show active services. I'm, not, I'm actually not very familiar with what uniforms actually mean and badges mean. Laura's mother then calls Bobby's coach. Bobby seems to be a football player. 
seems like. Been hard to tell. All these skinny high school boys don't look all that all that big and strong, but uh, they're still young. I'm sure they'll grow into the steroids later. The coach says that Bobby hasn't arrived yet, and in fact, he's been running late all the time for quite a while now. This is concerning to the mother because she knows that Laura has been spending a lot of time with Bobby and if he's late then what mischief is Laura getting up to? Then we cut to a random cute girl walking out of a hotel. She gets into a limo. She has a really horrible hairstyle. Really tight perm. Laura's mother, I can't remember if I mentioned her hair, was a giant perm. She looks like a member of the Jackson 5. This, these mid-90s hairstyles, I, I don't like to judge, you know, I'm sure they were quite the thing back in their day, but I mean, damn, most of the hair in this is ugly, men and women alike. We cut to a couple of men having a meeting, I think they're in the same hotel the young girl just came out of. Um, I should actually probably check the date this thing came out, didn't, shouldn't I? I mean, when did Twin Peaks come out? I keep saying 90s. It was 20 years ago, and I actually am not entirely sure. Gotta love here, I am checking my phone. Drama series, originally early 90s, 1990. So at this point, it is 29 years old, at the point at which I'm recording it. I suddenly feel horribly ancient, and that explains why I was also far too young to watch it, because I was 10 years old. Anyway, early 90s, late 80s, early 90s hairstyles courtesy of David Lynch. Thank you very much, Mr. Lynch. So we are back to the men having a meeting. Two men, they are talking about they saw them all going broke and they are trying to convince somebody to invest. They refer to the people in their meeting as cheese eaters. Now, I'm not American, as you can tell from my accent. As far as I understand, Cheese eating is generally referred to as something French people do, which I think is quite strange because Americans are quite notorious for eating a lot of cheese too, but I'm familiar with cheese eating surrender monkeys as a pejorative against French because I don't even know why, because the French have a long and storied military history. We go to a meeting, more of a conference sort of thing, with these uh, cheese eaters that the men spoke about. Uh, I don't know very much about North Northern European languages, but the accent seems more Dutch or maybe Scandinavian, um, probably Scandinavian. One guest is also called Sven, which confirms that it's probably Norwegian or Swedish or Danish or something like that. One of the men is called to the phone by the hotel concierge. We find out that he's Laura's dad. The sheriff is phoning him with the ominous news. No. The sheriff... I'm trying to make sense of my notes here. The sheriff doesn't phone. The mother phones. Mother phones to find out if, for some reason, Laura joined him at the hotel to... For some reason. I don't know why, she, why a high school girl would go hang around with her dad at a boring business meeting. But, you know, sometimes kids like to hang around with their parents. Not teenagers in my experience, but, you know, it can happen. While the mother is expressing her concern about Laura, Dad is on the phone, and the sheriff walks in, walks up to the hotel concierge, and asks for the man by name. Uh, his name was Leland Palmer. He walks in and asks for Leland Palmer. While Leland is on the phone, the concierge points him out, and... Leland can see straight away that something very serious is happening and looks very worried. The sheriff walks up to him, and even before he starts to talk, Leland starts to break down. He drops the phone, M mother hears the phone drop, and starts to freak out. She loses her, loses her stuff. Mum starts screaming, and I'm remembering why I actually stalled out every time I've tried to watch this show, because the mother's performance... I don't like to judge a person's grief. I have never lost a child, and I hope that never happens to me. But you know, this particular performance is quite annoying, and I think this is where I stop watching most of the time. But for you, dear listener, I'm going to carry on. 
We cut now to a diner. It's early morning, there's a young guy who offers to take the waitress home. I mean, it's a very kind offer, I'm sure, but I get a feeling that this is Bobby and he's up to some kind of mischief. There's an older waitress, I say older, she's probably early 30s, as opposed to the other waitress who looks late teens, early 20s. The older waitress is called Norma. She looks suspicious about Bobby taking the young waitress home, whose name I didn't seem to make a note of. That was very clever of me. Well done, Dave. Once the waitress and, I'm assuming, Bobby, but well, I could be wrong at this point, are in the car, they start making out furiously. A bit later on, we see them driving past a police car, police car with the lights flashing. The young girl seems like a naughty one, although she's just gotten off shift, so she's probably worked all night. She drinks out of a hip flask and shares it with Bobby, who is number one driving and number two on his way to school. So she's also a naughty girl. And again, I say I assume this is Bobby. No one's mentioned him by name yet that I've noticed, but I've got a feeling. Bobby asks the young waitress, whose name I still don't know, is the old man home? At this point, I'm assuming old man means dad, because she's really young. And she says, yes, he's away. He phoned from, I think it was Butte, Montana. I didn't uh, make a note. So he's not there. They are nearly at her house when they see a truck parked outside, which I'm assuming is the old man's truck because they both look rather scared by the situation. She quickly jumps out the car, runs off, and I assume Bobby speeds off. Now we go to the, I assume it's the police station or the mortuary. Leland Palmer and the sheriff walk in who I think I've seen referred to as Harry by this point. They walk in going into the going into the mortuary or the officers. The doc who was there for finding Laura's, Laura's body gave Leland a big hug. Leland is going to see the body and is very concerned but wants to see what they did to his baby. Uh, I can understand that, but I uh, also, poof, man, I can't even imagine what that must be like. Father's sad, of course, and he is crying. Then we cut to a school scene. A hallway with lockers, a pretty girl with a red sweater. Um, I would normally not comment on the looks of teenagers, but in the early 90s, Teenagers were often played by actors and actresses in their 30s, so I'm pretty sure this uh, actress is a lot older than we're supposed to think she is. She is in a red sweaty sweater, and this one, strangely enough, has quite a nice hairstyle. The girl who was in the limo earlier puts on shoes, which are high heeled and red, so I'm assuming family or whoever was back at the hotel would not approve of her change in footwear. She also has a quick puff of a cigarette, which she puts in the locker lit, which doesn't seem like a very good idea. It seems extremely unsafe. I'm wondering if at some point in the season we're going to have a fire in a locker thanks to a lit cigarette. Then we have Dana Boy coming in the front entrance. Dana Boy, who I assume Bobby, he comes marching in, making a big deal. Um, I'm confident stating at this point that this person is a twerp. He's extremely unlikable. Just just a jerk. Really don't like him already, and I mean, he's only spoken a few lines. I find out that limo girl, her name is Aubrey, the girl with the red sweater is called Donna. We find this out in their classroom while they're doing roll call. The show is actually quite clever about using the, uh, the uh, process of modern life to give you exposition it's actually it's something that i'm going to refer to a little bit later as well i mean i keep talking about the kid who i assume is bobby but i've re watched the whole episode so i know it is but i'm also trying to be honest with my impressions as we go but sometimes yeah the sort of mechanics of life are quite good at exposition we learn the names of a bunch of bunch of the characters in a sort of natural way Teacher's doing roll call, we find out who Aubrey is, we find out who Donna is, and well, we find out their names at least. And a deputy comes to speak to the teacher, asking after Bobby. 
and we find that this isn't Bobby's class. But when Donna takes a glance at the empty seat, which I guess Laura Palmer usually sat in, and then hears a woman screaming and running past outside, which is a little bit odd, she starts crying because she must know something's up at this point. There's another dorky looking guy who at this point I didn't catch his name who is playing with a pencil and it snaps in his hands because he seems to realize that something's up as well. We cut to the library. Bobby is very aggressive with the police. Um, I'm not a big fan of the police in general myself but when I was 17 years old I at least pretended to like them and not get in their faces whenever I was caught out doing something. Not that I was caught out doing something much, but you know, we've all got mischievous histories. Um, he doesn't seem to know what's up. They haven't explained to him that they found Laura Palmer's body and that he is in some way a suspect because he wasn't where he was supposed to be overnight. The headmaster is sitting there while uh, the sheriff is sitting there with a the deputy. And, but the sheriff sends him to go make announcements to the school to go get on the microphone and tell them what's going on. The sheriff then tells Bobby that Laura is dead and Bobby is very dramatic about this. Doesn't seem sad, he seems more upset that he seem, is being considered a, 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 a suspect. So he starts screeching and threatening officers, and he gets arrested. The principal sits down at the console for the uh, school PA system and starts making the announcement. It strikes me at this point that Twin Peaks seems to be very full of expressive and emotionally mature people because he starts crying while he's talking. You know, not of, most people most people in TV shows and maybe even in real life will sort of repress their feelings and their expressiveness rather than just start bawling in front of the students of their school. He announces that the um, school is dismissed for the day, which, oh, considering they all just got there, must be a, a relief for those who don't know Laura personally. They're all going to go have a day of trying to stay out of mischief, I assume, and grief, grieving. During, during the speech, we see the trophy case with Laura Palmer's photo in it. Um, it doesn't seem to be in any kind of uniform or anything. I'm not too sure why a random girl's photo would be in a trophy case. Maybe she was a homecoming queen or something, but uh, nothing that I notice suggests that. We zoom in very tight on the photo of Laura Palmer in the in the in the in the, in the, in the trophy case, and then that fades and blends into a, another photo of Laura sitting on a sideboard at her home, where once again we have the mother screeching and putting on a major a sort of Lady Macbeth level performance of grief. She tells the sheriff that Laura came home around 9pm. It's sort of startled to hear noises upstairs from Laura's room where the father and deputy are going and looking for evidence. The deputy, who if I recall correctly was the one who cried all the time, finds Laura's locked diary but they can't find the key for it. The father asks, do you have to take that? Which seems like a pretty stupid question because, like, surely a diary would be one of the more likely places to find something useful. So the deputy promises they'll bring it back as soon as possible and puts it in their box of evidence that they're collecting. The phone downstairs rings and one of the other deputies goes to answer it. Mother mentions that Laura got a call, well rather Sheriff Harry, who we found out his name is Harry by this point, confirmed it. He, she, Laura got a call in the evening, but the mother didn't know anything about it. The phone call was Lucy, the receptionist slash dispatcher from the police station. She called the Palmer house to tell Sheriff Harry that another girl hadn't come home. The 
fisherman from earlier is in the mill. Ah, uh, yeah, I've right, forgotten we, he was called Pete. He's sitting, sort of supervising, I can't remember exactly what he was doing. Yeah, the Asian woman from earlier comes in, we find out that she is the owner of the mill. The fisherman, I think's wife, is doesn't like this fact and is the manager of the mall. The two women are arguing over stopping production at the mall for the day because because the Asian lady thinks that maybe the staff need a little time to recover from the news that one young girl has been murdered and the daughter of one of their co-workers has been, uh, got, been, has been found missing. Ultimately, the Asian woman, who we find out is called Josie, stops production at the mall, and the, I think, fisherman's wife, who is, uh, seems to be an awful human being, is very upset about this. As she marches out in a temper tantrum, she comes past a man standing there and just tells him he's fired. We then cut to a beautiful shot of the scenery with a girl walking walking down the railway lines wearing what looks like a satiny sort of cami sort of thing she seems to be covered in blood or maybe just dirt and she gets seen by a rail worker who looks very shocked at the situation which i can believe i mean it's been a rough day for the whole town and here comes a young girl wandering wandering out of the forest looking the worst for wear we now have a petrol station, gas station, for my American listeners, probably most of you, where the dorky dude from the class, we see he's actually got a Harley, so maybe he's not as dorky as we seemed. He speaks to Ed, the owner of the gas station, and says, he's very upset and says that Laura was the one. While while dorky Harley guy and gas station Ed are having a conversation, a lady with one eye sticks her head out and calls to Ed that the drapes were ready at 10 and she wants them hung by night time. I don't know why she's so into drapes, but especially a day where someone was murdered, but we've all got our priorities and we all cope in our own ways. And maybe she just didn't like Laura or maybe she's also just like a bad person. You know, sometimes that happens. Then we cut to the star of the show. Carl McLaughlin is driving in, McLaughlin, I hope I say that right, I've actually never said it out loud in my life, Mr. Mac is driving into town, talking onto a tape recorder, he seems to be a really detail oriented person, he gives the exact location of the town in terms of how far from the state line, how far from the Canada border, we know this is pretty far north, and I have no idea where else it is. Uh, I think it's Pacific Northwest. Um, maybe should have done some research before starting this episode. Um, he's talking to tape recorder, giving a lot of details, and admiring how many trees forests seem to have in them. It's a bit expositiony, and the dictaphone is a bit of an odd thing. Um, I'm not sure if anybody in life has ever actually di dictated their whole life into a tape recorder, but it seems to work for Agent Agent Cooper, Dale Cooper, I seem to recall. I didn't write the name down here somewhere, or I did write it and I can't read it. There's quite a lot of that problem going on here. I'm actually making half of this up as I'm going along because my notes are terrible. Yes, as I said anyway, he has his exposition -y chats at the dictaphone and mentions that he's going to be meeting Harry S. Truman who is also, which is also rather the name of a president of the United States I do believe. Uh, I don't know which one when, I think it was during the Second World War. Uh, wasn't he the guy that uh, spoke about the nuclear bomb? I'm not sure. He also wondered, wonders aloud what kind of trees these are. We then come to him meeting with the sheriff. The sheriff is happy for the FBI and he's fine with taking instructions from the FBI because as Agent Cooper says, the FBI is on site, they take charge, they're not there to aid local enforcement, they're there to take over. 
He also asks what the trees are, and he is told that they are Douglas firs, which he finds quite exciting. He then finds out that there hasn't been an autopsy yet. So Agent Cooper decides to go see the girl that was found at the rail- railway tracks, who is now in hospital. They go to the girl. They find out that she was in the same high school as Laura Palmer, but there doesn't seem to be any other connection. They weren't friendly or didn't move in the same circles. Which I suppose happens even in small towns, although it is also a little bit strange. She, despite being found walking, she is now unconscious and unresponsive. They are trying to get a CAT scan for her to see what her long-term prognosis is. Uh, we found out her name is, uh, I looked it up and forgot to make a note, Renette Pulaski. Renette Pulaski. She is unconscious and unresponsive, and Cooper, Agent Cooper, decides to examine her fingernails very carefully. He looks under them and doesn't seem to find what he was looking for. Thank you for joining me on this episode of the Sleepy Time Tales podcast. The Sleep Aid podcast designed around a bedtime story to help you get a restful night. New episodes will be released every Sunday night to give you something fresh to help you rest in a new week. And in my first few weeks and months, I'm going to try to release a few extra episodes to help build up an archive so that I can give you, the listener, a night's worth of stories to leave running in the background. So please keep an eye out once you've subscribed to see what new stuff I release. A reminder that the music for tonight is Undeser Bakumiku. I got it off the free music archive, but you can check out more of their work on their website and their Patreon, which you will find links in the show notes. Thank you very much for joining me. Good night and sweet dreams.